really delighted uh, that Jez Stewart of the British Film Institute is here tonight. Uh, Jez, how would you describe yourself? An archivist? A film historian? What is your... how would you... Uh, I would say archivist. My job title is curator. Um, curator of animals. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Archive. Good man, everyone. Good man. <laughs> uh, and that's a job that encompasses a lot of things. I would say it's more archivist. It's in terms of dealing with the material that comes into the collection. Uh, so I look at some new animation co collection. I'm looking at the stuff that's already in there, bringing new stuff in, and then going out to find stuff that I think should be in there. Um, and dealing with the, in, the interpretation and promotion of it, which is where the, the curator bit comes in. Curator seems to be a sexier term for some people. I quite I'm like getting off artists. on it. I have to say, every work time you say curator, <laughs> oh! Yeah, yeah. yeah it's that's that the museum bit and kind of building a collection. But I, I, I like archivist because that, that's in terms of dealing with the kind of history of this material and, and the preservation of it. And that's the most important bit for me. But that preservation is also about making sure preserving the memory, making sure people see it and maybe people will share it. Um, and that's where the, the curated bit comes in. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. I think that's a, that's a, a, you know, an interesting definition. I first met Jez through uh, Vivian, Hall uh, Vivian Hallis, who quite a lot of you have met, uh, who's come and given a few talks here about her parents, uh, Hallis, John Hallis and Joy Batchelor. Uh, we saw some clips of their work earlier on. Um, Animal Farm, most famously, is, is one of their works. Um, Jez has been working closely with Vivian for a couple of years now on the Harrison Bachelor collection. Um, and uh, has also, uh, Jez has also been advising and helping on um, the documentary Remembering John Hallis. And are you working with her? You're, you're contri Jez is contributing an article to a book that Vivian is publishing on her mother, Joy Batchelor, whose centenary is next year. And I understand you just submitted your manuscript, is that right? Yes, yeah, she asked for 1,200 words and she got 5,000. <laughs> it was, she was good fun to write about. She's interesting, a very interesting character and um, very privileged to access some things that, that Vivian shared. Uh, with me, but yeah, the Hans and Baxter collection was the way I've been working at the BFI for about 12 years now, and I didn't nothing to do with animation when I started, and but that was always been my interest uh, since I can't remember, and um, and that collection coming was the way that I was able to elbow my way into doing the job that I do now, which is exclusively working with the animation collection, and working with that Hans and Baxter collection and also the Bob Godfrey material. Um, which came in around about a similar time, they both kind of piqued my interest, particularly in a period of uh, like a kind of first golden age of British animation, kind of from the mid 50s to the mid 60s, which is when TV cartoons started, which mm -hmm. brings us to our topic neatly yeah. and seamlessly. Mm -hmm. um, before you move on neatly, neatly and seamlessly, I just want to, uh, to say uh, a few words. Uh, to, to interject somewhat. Um, as I've been trying to get Jess to come along to do a talk for quite a few months, so I'm, I'm really delighted we finally got him. Um, George Dunning, uh, for me, uh, is a fascinating topic. Um, he is a very important figure in post-war British animation, but someone who I think is, has been passed over. He's not nearly as famous as, as, as Bob Godfrey and um, Alison Batchelor and so on, yet he directed Yellow Submarine, which is one of those defining feature films. The sec was that the second ever British animated feature? Depends how you define it, but yes, it's the second proper cinema feature release, I would say. There's a there's a, a TV thing the year before, which is kind of feature length, 60 minutes, Rudigore, um, oh, which did yeah. get cinema released in this country, but it was made for American television. Um, it's not very good though, is it, to be brutally... It has <laughs> some nice bits in it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, and I feel that, that George Dunning isn't very well known at all and has been, you know, unfairly passed over. So, uh, I, I'm, I personally wanted to learn more about him. Um, so, yeah, here are the two things put together, Jez and 
George Dunning. So please give uh, Jez a big round of applause. <laughs> So I, I don't express myself to be any expert on George Dunning, but I'm not sure that there necessarily is one. And as I said, the thing that really interests me is the kind of the particular period where he started off on in his real career. Um, but to go back to the beginning, he was born in 1920 in Toronto, Toronto, as they call it over there, apparently. Um, and he started at the National Film Board of Canada in 1941, 1942, I think, 1942. And he started working with Norman McLaren, um, who I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, Norman McLaren went over and was asked to set up that animation unit over there uh, by John Grierson around about that time, same time. And I think George Dunning had been doing little bits of kind of graphic design, but he was immediately kind of brought into that that unit. Um, and he worked on um, some. Uh, they did some kind of folk songs called uh, Chant Populaire. In, in, in in French, and there's a series of those. But what seemed to the film that he first got to direct and mark his real stamp on is um, is called uh, Le Cadet Roussel, um, which is available. And I'll, I'll put the link to you, Martin. It's Please. available on the, the NFP website, and it uses um, it's a cut out animation film that was done with bits of metal, as I understand it, and they cut little bits of animation. And it does it has some quite seems to have some sort of simulated multi-plane work, and it's a really quite interesting uh, uh, film, and that can be seen through the NFB site, and that's well worth looking out. So he worked there, um, and he obviously picked up from Norman McLaren, went through into the late 40s. Um, he then went, uh, he got some kind of UNESCO grant, and went to Paris and worked there for about a, a year, six months to a year, and he worked with um, Bertolt Bartosz who uh, started doing animation with Lotte Reinecke on eventually Prince Ahmed. Um, but then he's best known for his film uh, Lide, if, if you know that film. Um, it's based on uh, the kind of woodcut uh, story by um, Franz Mazariel. And the film Lide is a really, really interesting piece. So he worked with him uh, through UNESCO, as I understand it, in Paris or Science. So he had some experience of Europe. I have no don't really know what kind of works they worked on together um, and then he went back to, to Toronto and set up a, a small animation studio and was working out there and apparently there they gave Michael Snow um, his first uh, kind of experience as a job if you know him and there's something about Richard Williams going there as a very precocious uh, um, mm -hmm. kind of animator at certain times uh, as a very young man and getting some experience and having some knowledge of George Dunning there. George Dunning was tempted away. Do you know the UPA studio in, in, uh, in the States, United Productions of America? It came out of um, lots of disgruntled ex Disney animators who, um, who set up their studio in, in the mid 40s. Um, in the Second World War, basically making some stuff, and, and after the war, they, they gained the provenance, pushing the real kind of cartoon modern school of animation, and got the notoriety through films like Gerald McBoing Boing, um, winning a lot of Oscars. And there was a Gerald McBoing Boing TV series which UPA got a, a grant to do, and that was made in, in New York. UPA was based in, in Los Angeles, and they opened a UPA in New York. And George Darling came across and worked there and built up. Uh, as a job as a kind of an animation director. And around about the same time, you have commercial television starting in the UK. So you have uh, September the 21st, 1955, don't ask me why I remember that day, um, you have the opening night of commercial TV on, in, in, in Britain, in London, to a very small audience. It can't really be stated enough quite what a big thing that was for the British animation scene. There'd never, ever been any money apart from little bubbles around kind of propaganda work for the First World War and the Second World War. Otherwise, there'd been pretty much a dearth of anything. Commercial TV coming in that, on that time was a huge kind of a boost of, of nobody knew what they were doing. They had to make adverts for TV. They didn't know whether they needed to copy cinema adverts. They didn't know whether they needed to copy American TV adverts, whether it was radio adverts. They didn't know what to do, and animators said, well, we can do it, we're brilliant. And there was this huge opportunity to all these companies kind of shot up all over the place. Um, uh, 
and there was a really kind of explosion of these kind of boutique animation firms. But the agencies themselves seem to really look to the continent and to the states to, to look for real quality work. And they looked to UPA, and the first they were taking commercials, they were commissioning commercials in New York and on Los Angeles. So UPA decided that they would open up a London office, and George Dunning was brought across to, um, to be one of the kind of creative directors of that studio. It lasted about seven months, uh, and then they realised that they weren't going to make enough money. Apparently they were paying their animators twice as much as uh, all the British studios, and the, the age, advertising agencies realised that, that they weren't prepared to pay those extra fees if they were on their doorstep. So the studio closed, um, but Dunning decided to stay. Um, and John Coates, he met John Coates, it's always told they met in a pub, randomly, and they somehow, John Coates was working in TV production for Associated Rediffusion, uh, and somehow they basically um, got together to make a, uh, an animation studio, initially called TV Cartoons, um, I think it started in 1957, uh, from 1961 it was known as TVC London. Um, so they set up TV cartoons making uh, commercials, firstly. But apparently George Dunning was never particularly interested in commercials, he wanted to do his own thing. And so from very early on he would put in resources in terms of, well, in, in downtime, let's do our own films. Let's do our own films for ourselves. The first film was called The Wardrobe, unfortunately I don't have a copy of that uh, for you this evening, it was made in 1957. Um, I have a feeling I may actually have a copy with me, but it would take a while to find it. Yeah, I don't, it's, it's not necessarily, it, it's, a, it's a nice kind of opening film uh, to what they did, um, but the, the style of it is similar to the later works. I don't think uh, George Dunning actually animated on it, um, I think he just did uh, design and directed it. Um, but that was their first kind of, sort of independent work. Um, and then it kind of went on from there, they set up something called, a side body called Industrial Animation, uh, to make sort of longer sponsored works. They opened up a studio in Italy, which I never quite got to the bottom of, and I don't think it lasted about five minutes. I think they just probably wanted a holiday home. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, it was, it was a TVC Italia for a, for a while. I've seen adverts for it. Um, but they got a real reputation for making real quality commercials, and they continued with these kind of independent shorts. And so the first one I want to show is from 1962. It's a film called The Apple. Um, you need to go to the menu and, 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 and find it because it's not the first one on, on, in play order. So press, I need to skip. If you press the menu button, is there a menu button on there? Uh, there is. Um. <laughs> See if you can find it. Um, so it was made and it was the first kind of collaborative effort of the, the TBC studios. Um, so every animator there had a different scene. And um, there you go, so number four. Um, and the animators who were working there were a real mix of kind of backgrounds from around the animation scene. Some of them went back to um, some of you may be familiar with Gomont British Animation, which was um, J. Arthur Rank, big, the closest the Britons come to a media mogul, decided that he wanted an animation studio to take on Disney uh, during the war. Um, he set it up in 1944. He sunk just loads and loads of money into setting up the studio. He trained these animators for three years. They didn't really produce anything apart from a few cinema commercials for three years. Um, and he sent a lot of money. And some of the people from that, it, it kind of it folded in the 1950s. It was a huge financial uh, a, a disaster because British animation never really made much money. Um, but so they had some animators from there, like Jack Stokes. Uh, they had other people who'd come from, from overseas and all over the place. And, and this film, The Apple, was a real kind of, uh, all the different animators pitching in with their own scene. It was scripted by Stan Hayward, who should be familiar to this room. He, Stan has been, I think, to these events three times, and on one occasion gave, <coughs> I think, a 32 minute spontaneous talk, uh, <laughs> completely unrehearsed, and um, that is up on our uh, YouTube channel. I will try to find the relevant bit, and maybe extract it as well, and put it there as a as a short piece. But he doesn't talk yeah, about. Yeah, Stan wrote a few of these films, and he is a unique scriptwriter in British animation history. And his films, having seen a lot of them in a short period of time, there's a real interesting tone that spreads across all of them. It's really super unique, and it's there in the Apple. Apparently, it was storyboarded by Richard Williams, um, and. 
uh, in talking about it, George Darling's presence is um, is in terms of pushing people in particular ways, uh, uh, not necessarily a creative actually drawing on the film, and you'll see his drawing work later. Um, but the most particular influence you have in this film it also seems to be the soundtrack, which is completely unique. It just came up with the idea and everybody thought, what on earth are you doing? Um, and it has a very distinct timing. Um, so we should show it. What's the actor? Captain, do you mind uh, turning the light off? Right. It's the switch in the... In the, in the <laughs> Come on! <laughs> So that's, that's all, uh, actually, uh, no more materials, uh, that doesn't look good, um, we don't have decent materials on most of these films in the VFI, I've no idea where the negatives are, we have Duke Negs for The Wardrobe, his first film, and we don't have Negs for any of the others, and I would love to have, um, to know that they were, they were better looked after, um, I don't know where they are, Jane Pilly looked them a few years ago, uh, Find them. So it would be really nice to, to make sure that these films were preserved properly because at the moment, uh, officially in terms of uh, proper archival collections, I think they only survive in terms of prints um, and, and scratchy ones at that. Um, so that's the apple. Uh, ironically, whilst the film prints aren't preserved, we actually have every single cell of animation of that film, <laughs> including uh, they're all cells apart from one, which is um, the flashbulb, which is on paper. Which is Kind of a, a scratch of charcoal, scratch of apple. You've got every single cell. And we so also you could remake it if you really wanted to. No. Yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> um, but you see what I mean in terms of the soundtrack, this kind of unique thing, and that seems to be the kind of man that he was, just having a very different perspective that he would just kind of chuck into the mix and provoke people in different ways. He would never, never seem to give direct direction to his animators. He'd kind of say, well, that but quite what I had in mind. Mm -hmm. And that was all the kind of direction that you would get that would make you think again. Or he would bring somebody in on a project who he knew would really annoy you. Um, Jerry Hibbert says this in one of the documentaries about him. Um, or Alan Ball or somebody else. He basically he'd bring somebody in who would annoy you because they would make you question the way that you were doing it. Um, they would make you question your preconceived ways. He seems to have been a very good boss if a very vague one. And very difficult to get a straight answer out of. I don't know whether that's a good thing in terms of being a boss or a bad thing. Probably a bad thing when you want a pay rise. Um, a good thing when you want to, to just be inspired in a certain way and the freedoms that he gave the animators. But the Apple was a film released in 1962. Like I say he didn't direct or any, any animation on it, uh, as I understand it. The other film that was released in 1962, also a Stan Hayward quip, um, script, is The Flying Man which George Dunning did, again as I understand it, pretty much every single uh, frame of it. Again, we're very lucky that we have all the original pencil drawings and all the original cells in, a, in, in the BFI National Archive. And the pencil drawings are drawn quite conventionally in terms of the characters. They're spare, similar style to that. The cells are something completely different. And the best way to demonstrate that is to probably show it. So that's number one on the uh, on the menu, and that's the Flying Man, which was also '62. So it's the same year. A very very. Oh, oh sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, so that that was the kind of the the stuff that kept the studio going, basically making. They did a lot of famous commercials for Mother's Pride. Um, and, and, and other films like that, and they they made you know three times, four times as many films for Sorry. the National Coal Board as they did independent films. But I think you can see from that Hans Knees and Bumsy Daisy in particular how they some of the kind of the, the the drawing style and some of the kind of the different ways of doing things kind of crept into the, the kind of the, the drawing of the woman um, in the the striptease part. You kind of got no outline to it. She's done quite broad strokes. Um, so they were, they, were, they were playing, they were being able to use um, different ways of doing things. Another gig, commercial gig that they got in the, the mid-60s um, was to make a, uh, an American TV series, kids TV series pretty much, but it crossed over into, I think, I think kids TV was, was brought to the fine in those days, and it would have to go for a more general audience 
um, on, on the, the Beatles. Um, and that led to them getting the gig to do uh, it was King Finger's King Features Syndicate in the States who, who sponsored that that TV series and they wanted to do a feature. They seemed to be the prime mover behind it and they went to T V C to say do you want to do it? Um, and they wanted something very much in the style of, of the series because they wanted it to be done cheaply. Um, but but at TBC and George Dunning in particular were not interested in doing that. They wanted to do something different. This was the opportunity, this was some American money to make, I mean what it was, it was pretty much the second uh, British feature film, really. The, the second opportunity, the first one got money from, uh, American Animal Farm got money from America, possibly from the CIA and all sorts of things going on. Uh, Rudigal from 1967 was American TV. The other submarine was again American money, um, and George Dunning's presence is, is, is all over uh, the other submarine. And I, I don't know how much I want to talk about it because it's the easiest thing to actually see elsewhere. You should, you should buy the DVD, you should see the film, and do it. I'd, I'd rather show something else twice, um, which is a bit greedy of me. But uh, what maybe we we could have a look at next is. Um, the film uh, The Maggot, which is in a very, very different style to, to the previous work that you've seen. It seems to be that style seems to particularly come from a guy, a designer called Mick Crane. Um, there's another link that I'll give you, Martin, is there's a film um, called uh, Loom Rock, which was um, TVC did with Edward de Bono, and it's about lateral thinking. It's completely nuts, it's, and it's, it's, it's come out on, the, on the, the internet in the last couple of years and there's a really a nice clean copy of it on there and it's well worth looking at because it's completely outstanding. But the style of it is similar to this film, um, in, in parts of it are similar to this film, The, the Maggot, which is um, it's an American co-production um, with a guy called uh, Topper Carew. Um, it's an anti-drugs film. And it's, yeah, it's a very different style to the other films. I think it's from 1973. Um, so let's watch the magic. I didn't say it was subtle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's an interesting... It is different. It's, it, you can maybe see little bits of your submarine and a different way of doing things. I think there's something of, of George Dunning does seem to have a particular thing in terms of the, the partial representation of bodies and faces that, that's there in there. I forgot to mention that there's a particular trope in, in the films that you might have noticed in terms of the, at the end of the film a character walking off and getting smaller and smaller and disappearing in the background, which was there in the wardrobe seemed to be the first time they did it in 57. But at the end of that he explodes. But it seemed to be a trope that was taken on by a lot of um, of, uh, of, of British animation films. I think uh, it's in a Bob Godfrey film called Two Off the Cuff. I think the guy walks into the background. I might be mixing it up with another one. It's that Harold Whitaker film, the, the, flow, the flow diagram one. Does he walk uh, from the back? Well, well he, he almost he chases the dog and kind of becomes a dot and then comes back again. Yeah, there does seem to be something that there's a rhyming across certain things and intentional or not. Um, uh, but the, through all these things, um, there's a film that, that George Dunning seems to be working on kind of pretty much by himself in his spare time. Just sitting in his office, he apparently bought these little kind of um, three inch by two inch, as it was described, but they must have been a little bit bigger than that. These little kind of pieces of kind of index paper, um, these tiny pieces, and he would sort of doodle away with them and do these little drawings on them. And he'd just sit at his desk and do it in the meantime. And they were animation drawings, but they weren't on animation paper. And everybody kind of looked over his shoulder and went, "Well, how are you, how are you, how are you going to film that? How are you, there's no there's no peg, but there's no kind of holes or peg bars. There's no kind of registration to them. You know, what are you going to do with them? Are you going to kind of Xerox them onto cells? And, and he just kind of potted away with it in his own um, his own way." Um, I should say he's a very difficult man to pin down. He seems to be this real mix of kind of businessman and artist. Apparently he would always be dressed in immaculate suits. You'd never see him in anything but a suit. But he, his socks probably wouldn't match. Um, sorry. 
Uh, so he's a really difficult guy to kind of pin on, and this just seems to be something that he came up with by himself. It's a film called Dame and the Mower. It's a really, really special film. It's one of the most extraordinary films that I've ever seen. It, it's, it's a film that, that really lays bare the process of animation, um, as you'll see. And it, it's, it's, it's intelligent, it's partly joyous in the way that the characters move. Um, so if you in, indulge it, I'd really like to show it twice, because I think you need to see it twice. But, but you could disagree, we'll take a vote. But if you show Damon the Mower, so this is the film that he did in these little kind of index cards. Um, and uh, and Damon the Mower was an Andrew um, Martin film. And this film, he, George Denning was really unsure about it. He was really shy, he didn't, he didn't put it into festivals, um, which I think it would have done really well. Apparently John Coates named it his, his favourite film. Um, and, and it's it definitely one of mine. So I, I think we should show uh, Damon Mower. Why it was made that way, you know, it's, 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 you know with these panels like that. He was, I think he just wanted to pot around with it in his own time. He didn't want to do it in any He wanted something that he could just keep in his pocket and take out and, and sketch out and, and, and put it back. And because he didn't, he didn't necessarily think of it as a finished film, he thought of it as a piece of... He thought of it as just that he was just animating. And I think there's such... The, the figures that, that jump around, they seem... It's such a joy to them, to me, and they kind of they start to bounce around these little figures, and and the way that the they they, they really struggles to keep the registration of the character when he goes to the side. You see the kind of the, the cards really struggling to keep the registration in there. You see the numbers kind of flexing through. In fact, Jimmy Murakami, who worked at the TVC uh, uh, for a while, um, when he saw it, he was kind of he was most enamoured with the numbers and said, wow, it's amazing that you can click, because that's something that analysts would have in, in there, in, in, in the corner, and be kind of always hidden away from the audience, and he was like, wow, that's the most impressive bit. So what about the jury? He said, yeah, they're fine, but those numbers are amazing. And just kind of laying bare that process of animation is something that, I think the studio had to, to force him to find a way to film it, because he was not necessarily interested in that, and like I say, it wasn't, he would, he, apparently showed it to a very select few of his staff and he wasn't sure about it and it wasn't other films were put into festivals but that one wasn't um, and it's such a it's such a special film and in the documentary about him I think it's Jack Stokes who says that, that, that nobody else could have made that film that was a uniquely George Dunning film um, which documentary is this? I don't know there's a film called the, the Man Who Moved the Beatles that was done in 91 Channel for, um, and it's not easy to, there's a copy in the archive if you go through the research viewing service and pay your £10, but uh, the, 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 that was made uh, then. Um, and that interviews you know, John Coates and Jack Stokes and um, Alan Ball and other people who, and Jimmy Murakami and people who worked at TBC. Um, and so TBC continued, and uh, there was an art project that, that um, George seemed to, to chip away at, and that's, that's The Tempest. So I, you have a little uh, clip of, of I've that. got some clips of that that I might show. I don't want to break the flow. I might show that. that that's, that's the end. I mean, in terms of what I'm saying, it's a, pro, it's a film that he kind of chipped away at. Uh, he let other people animate it. He would give and say, well, there's you know, a few ideas. Um, when you go and play with it, and he approached it in the same spirit, seemingly, as, uh, as Damon the Mower, but with a bit more confidence. So it's based on Shakespeare's Tempest, uh, and it wasn't finished. And, uh, and they couldn't finish it, because there was no real script, there was no real storyboard, it was all in, in, in George's head. Um, and so, and he kind of did lots of di metamorphosing with different characters, and so he knew what they were going to turn into, but, but nobody else did, and he seemed to be playing with it. Um, and quite how far it would have gone, and it probably would have been finished. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, George died in 1979. Um, he was extremely asthmatic, uh, I, I believe. He had problems with it, his breathing. Um, and he died uh, relatively early in 1979. TVC continued, most famously, with The Snowman. 1982, so the studio picked itself back up together. When the wind blows, 84, 86, um, um, 
and, and continued in, in, into the, the 90s um, and still has some kind of uh, legacy on it that pretty much all, um, all, all died out now with John Coase and uh, also death earlier this year. So that, that's the kind of TV story and it's the George Stanley story. He could have done a lot more. Um, but what he did, I think, is, uh, is 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 pretty extraordinary. And I think Martin's right that he is a figure who who does tend to get looped over or just gets considered for for the Beatles, where his touch is certainly all over that film. But I think something like Damon Moa, Flying Man, it, are, are, are much more George films. And the the sketches, they um, after. George's death, um, TVC put together what they could of um, The Tempest, um, uh, something called The Sketches for The Tempest, um, and the negatives of that are preserved in the BFL National Archive, and I believe that's the kind of material that was used in the, the Masters of Animation series um, that, uh, that Martin has a clip for. So we could show that, otherwise I'm done unless there's any particular question. I've got a question. Yes. Um, would would the BFI consider doing a retrospective DVD of his work? Um, on camera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it off. We, we, we can switch that around. Yeah. Really. Uh, yeah. We tell camera. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, off. <laughs> it's, off. <laughs> it's off now. I really hope so. I really hope so. But I, it, it's difficult because the DVD market is dwindling and. Um, and how you can put the resources uh, throughout it. You thought it was going to be much more exciting than that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I hope so, but it, it, it's difficult, it's hard. And like I say, the elements aren't there in the collection at the moment. All we have are, are, are prints for these films, except for the wardrobe, which we've got a cheap neck. Um, so it, it, it's definitely a real lesson to, to all our mates out there in terms of look after your masters. Um, because at the moment these films only survive in this very compromised form. Um, well, hopefully there are names out there that may be allowed, they may be um, um, with, with John Coates' estate, um, but I know they have been looked for and, uh, and not found, so uh, it, would be, uh, it would be nice to do so. But, uh, I hope so. Am I right in thinking that you gave a talk at the National Film Theatre about this golden age? of British animation. I think Vivian gave me the wrong time, so I turned up late and I came in during the middle of it. Um, but I think... I gave I remember, a talk about um, the two centenaries last year. John Harris um, uh, and Peter Sachs, who yes. were both uh, born in, um, in 1912 and had a huge impact on British animation. Uh, John Harris, much more well known. Peter Sachs is a figure who is much less known. Um, because of the kind of films he produced. He never got the opportunity to produce an independent film like this. Uh, he only made kind of sponsored work, and so he's a kind of a forgotten figure. I gave a talk in New York about uh, the Golden Age of Animation, oh, which, was, um, which was a good jolly. Um, and it's something that I definitely want to do more with, and I hope that, um, that we could do more with that, and making those kind of, that kind of period out there. Because it's a really interesting period with that TV money coming in and then pretty much dying out by, by the 60s on. But advertising agencies seem to be particularly enamored with advertising. Plus, you had this weird tax situation where, um, I can't believe I'm going to talk about taxes. Um, <laughs> after the war, the Labour government wanted to encourage companies to reinvest into their own companies rather than give it to shareholders. And companies didn't want to hand they could keep, if they, any profits they kept, they had to pay a huge tax rate. Any profits they spent on the, the company, they paid a much smaller tax rate. So they basically, rather than give it to the government, they invested in sponsored film. So they lavished all this money on these kind of sponsored documentaries and instructional films. And Larkin Studio was something that was a huge benefit to that. That's what, um, that's where Bob Wolfe came from and, uh, and many other figures. Um, and Harrison Bachelor really profited from that. TBC probably not so much, um, but that's a particularly. So you had this, you had this big money. You had a kind of a boost from the, the Second World War propaganda. You had Animal Farm going on in '54, uh, and then 
um, this kind of tax break stuff, and it all came at the right moment. And for 10 years, and in the middle of that, you had the real kind of international animation scene kicking off. So you had the, the first kind of Annecy Festival, you had the setting up of Asifa uh, in 1960, and this real kind of boost. And, and some of these films actually did get distribution in little programs that would go around the world, and that's um, kind of going out there. And by the mid 60s, it, it kind of money kind of died away, so you were back to um, putting. putting there was less excess profits to kind of put into to things like this. Um, and that's what makes it difficult in terms of talking about this kind of work is that so much of it is in that sponsored realm, like your Thud and Blunder, like um, um, Hans Needs and Bootsy Daisy, and those are kind of quite accessible films. If you get a 23 minute film about the, the instructional makeup of, of the ICI company, there's some extraordinary design work in that film, but it's very difficult to, to sit through 23 minutes of it, even for somebody who's extremely interested in it. But the more you can pick out of that story, it, um, it is there. So, yeah, I hope it's something that I get to write up more of. Um, and do you, uh, is the, uh, if people want to find out more, um, are there resources online that you've written? Uh, no, I've written a chapter for a book, which isn't out yet, um, about... Uh, the relationship between um, advertisers and animators at the start of commercial TV, um, which was, was quite fun, and there was like a couple of years where they could kind of do what they wanted, and then the advertising agency realised that, that, that no, you couldn't because it was this is our job and we know what I'm doing. And there was a kind of little bubble in that, and that's something that if it gets published, then um, yeah, but I'll do more, but I just I keep. Shooting out kids, I've got no time left. It's, um, <laughs> it's a terrible thing. Don't have kids. <laughs> your, your time goes. But, um, but once they've grown up, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll do more. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, any more questions? Um, I've got a real s stupid question about Andrew Marvel. Mm -hmm. you know, do, do you have, I, I, don't, I don't have to know that poem, is it? but does that no, poem? I'm, have any kind of resonance? Does it, you know, do, do you know how it works with the, with, with the, the animation? I think because it seems really, you know, the animation looked really quite dark to me. You know, the side is cutting grass, and then it's sort of like a grim reaper mm. kind of coming around. I think it was a way of, of tie, again tying in the animation in terms of trying, trying to put some kind of structure in terms of something that was very, very elaborate doodles to a certain extent. And the fact that he could do them to that ability is just one of the most extraordinary things. Um, I mean, the, the soundtrack to it, the idea of it was kind of lying back in a field on a summer's day and you think it would be silent, but actually there's a lot of sounds going on out there. I, I think the animation came before bringing in the poem. Um, Personally, but I, I, I may be wrong. I mean, it's the kind of thing that Dunny seems to be an extremely literate character and probably would have had his fingers in all sorts of pies. And um, yeah. Okay, well, will you all please join me in thanking Jess for a really fantastic and <laughs> <laughs>